Welcome back to Finding the Edge podcast. I'm Garrett Boyum, joined with Robert Fry. Today, my fellow podcast listeners, we will be talking a lot about StatCast video and how to best optimize its usage for coaching purposes, some overlays, some attentional blindness, novelty with constraints in a training environment, perspective control, and some deception. Yeah. And part of our discussion was around a tweet about a study on how anticipation actually can make athletes more susceptible to deception. And so we kind of discussed that further and that kind of kicked off uh, our conversation today. So I hope you guys enjoy today's podcast. good spot all right so pitch ai may be an iphone app or is it not an iphone app and then some like the baseball world is split in half um between iphone and uh android is that what you're telling me yeah because I, I mean seriously like for most of the technology that you can use it seems like it's more feature-esque when you are on under iOS rather than Android's operating systems, which I don't know it, the process of like app development between mm -hmm. Android and iPhone. I know it's a lot easier to get your app developed and through the Google Play Store through Android rather than it is um, through the iOS because the iOS takes more time. It's a more of a process there. But maybe in terms of like feature building, it's a lot easier in android or no excuse me a lot easier in iphone than it is android because i don't know uh maybe you know because the design of iphones are a lot more simplistic so maybe the the app building side of it too is more simplistic than android mm -hmm. so maybe but yeah i mean it's just it's if you are in the baseball community and you don't and you use technology and you don't use some form of iOS, you're you're already behind. Hmm. And me being a huge Android guy, it, it kind of sucks saying that because I'm I'm yep. big into Android. I've I uh, a couple of years ago I switched to iPhone and within three days my iPhone completely went to black, shut down. And that it was not on my end, it was on Apple's end. They sent me a faulty phone hmm. and it took me another two weeks to get a new phone. And yeah, and so every Android I've had, aside from after using it for a while, you know, the battery kind of sucks after a while. I've never had, you know, those kind of problems. Yeah. I know um, for me, since I've had an iPhone, I have like a 5S. And now the battery life on it lasts forever, but I also don't use it that much. So that's probably the other reason is that how much you use it drains the battery quite a bit, what apps are running. So, but what are, what are all the apps, typical apps that are stuck on for baseball on uh, the iOS that aren't on Android? I thought they were on both. So... Most. I know um, there's there's certain iOS apps that have more features. So like something that I used last year um, while coaching in a summer league was uh, Blast Motion. And the thing is, luckily I had I had both an iPad and a Android tablet. But the iPad allows you to see things like the 3D Swing Tracer. They allow you to see more metrics than the Android does. But the one thing that the Android does have that I saw recently is you can see swings for, or it's a lot easier to get to swings from, you know, a year ago rather than mm. iOS has it more set up where it's like more of a recency uh, type of, you know, cache, if you want to call it, where they, they'll load the most recent swings. But if you haven't taken any swings in such a long time, then it, they won't load up. However, with Androids, you can pull up any swing at any time at least through through the apps. Now, I'm sure if you go on like the website, you can probably pull it up either way. But if you're just really on a 
you know, an Android tablet compared to an iOS tablet, and let's say you want to see player access swings in the fall, you're probably not going to be able to see that as quickly on an iOS device compared to an Android device. Mm-hmm. So that's that's definitely one thing. Um, I don't I don't know for sure, but I think Modus is more feature esque on iOS um, compared to Android. And then there's more there's more apps on iOS that I know. Um, someone that I've talked to, uh, his name's Wes Anderson. He actually coaches nearby where I live. He coaches at uh, Minooka Central High School, and he built a iOS app called like a bullpen pitch randomizer, where essentially mm. You just, the bullpen tells you, okay, here's your spot. It's a number. You got to hit that spot. And then it just, you basically just store that into a database and you say, all right, here's how frequently I hit my spots. Here's how I didn't hit my spots. It's a very simplistic act, but only on iOS. Have you seen, um, do you follow uh, Leg Kick Nation? Yes. On Twitter? Yes. Did you see the um, software that he's using? Um, or his facility is using for their live ABs. I took a glance, but I didn't look that much into it. So I don't know what what software he's using, other than the fact that it basically has some sort of machine learning or automated. Um, it basically can automate the editing process for clipping all the videos. You see that? Um, and. That's that's huge because I just I pulled it up, but that's huge because that's that's the thing that I personally like want to accomplish, you know, in the next couple of years is be able to say, Hmm. all right, basically take like be able to do what Synergy does, but myself where, you know, Mm -hmm. instead Mm -hmm. of having to watch like a three hour baseball game for our for an upcoming opponent, we can instead just here you go, put it through machine learning and it just chops it up so and so. Um, there's ways to do it, but you kind of have to catch for error, error catching. So I know in machine learning, there's a way to kind of use like a, a, a network where you can look into the, say the batter's box. So if the batter's box is visible each time a new batter steps in. That's when you say, okay, here's the new batter. This is when it comes up at this timestamp, but there may be times where let's say, you know, a runner scores, but he walks through the batter's box. That might that might count that as a new batter when it's really not the case. Or if he steps all the way out in between pitches. Right. Exactly. So he steps all the way out in between pitches. Um, so I guess another way too is you could probably combine it by saying, okay, person steps in his batter box and then read jersey number as well. Mm-hmm. So that way there's no there's no duplicates at that end. So if if one of those are present, then you shouldn't go to the next batter. Well, I mean, I think it's more of the fact that like you just need um, if you're just thinking about clipping the videos, you just need start and end points. So like, hey, here are the characteristics of a start and end point, And I want you to clip this every time we get to a start and an end point. Right. And, um, and so I think that's that's the big thing now for, you know, college programs there. They want video coordinators. And that's one of the jobs of those video coordinators, essentially. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of sitting um, behind home plate and you maybe, you know, charting balls and strikes, have, you know, a pitcher who maybe threw the day before or is going to throw the next day and have them chart, but then have that person just record timestamps. OK, here's when player X is at bat started. Here's when it ends. Or then you can record, you know, timestamps of here's when he swung. Here's when, you know, he hit the ball well. And then same for pitchers. Here's his strikes. Here's his balls. So on and so forth. Well, um, bats basically right. works like that. Um, so like it, it basically starts a clock. You like, once you start your charting, um, you basically, you know, hit start for start of game, probably when the umpire says, you know, play ball or whatever. And then you, you probably hit start and then you just start tracking the game. And as you put in, the different counts, it'll have timestamps and it'll know how to sync that with the video. Um, Cause my understanding when you put in the video, you have to sync up the start points between all the different video. And then from there, it'll just go and clip everything. Um, <clears throat> I've seen some of it. It's sometimes if you don't 
sync it quite right. It and probably too, if you sync it just a little bit wrong on the initial batter, when you get into the third or fourth inning or later at bats, it becomes fairly unsynced. Um, right, and then it'll add up over time. So yeah, yeah, I think, and so on that end, I think one like. Yes, it's nice to have someone do kind of that that end and kind of have that error checking. But two, wouldn't it be great if, you know, for advanced scouting at the collegiate level or the amateur level in general, if you have your opponent's video, be able to just download that or upload a link and then it automatically just, you know, cuts the video for you. So where yep. maybe you can create like essentially what Synergy does, where you can create you know, let's say you upload this video of a game and you'll say, okay, the first pitch actually starts at 10 minutes in. And then you say the last pitch ends at, you know, two hours, 47 minutes and 33 seconds. And then it, from what we talked about earlier through that uh, machine learning modeling, where, you know, every time a batter steps in the box, then you can be able to, you know, clip between certain batters or things, things in that sense where, you don't have to dedicate, you know, three to six to nine hours for the weekend or, you know, for Monday through Thursday for your Friday, Saturday, Sunday opponents, rather than just upload it. All right. You got all the clips. Now, now you can just save, save a bunch of time and then be able to focus on, Hey, let's, let's start working on, you know, our practice plan for this week, or let's start working on, you know, maybe developing our players more. Not saying that, you know, coaches don't really develop players. I'm just saying that there's not so much time in a given week to be able to do all of this stuff. Right. And I think that's the the biggest thing is with a lot of this technology, like technology should free you up to be able to do other things. And um, I mean, that's where I'm looking at sort of this not just from a scouting standpoint, because it all is dependent upon whether or not your opponent gets video or somebody gets video of your opponent. But just from a developmental standpoint, you being able to video your own players. And then once you have that footage that you're not spending hours and hours worth of time editing, you can actually spend your time analyzing. Um, and that that saves you a ton of time to be able to work with players more. And so that that to me is the the huge benefit of that. Um I guess what other what other things have you been um thinking about so uh, either in I this realm actually, or other things? I uh, actually purchased a uh, video editing software that's uh, basically the um Windows version of iMovie but with kind of more features. So Right now, I'm essentially just mm -hmm. recreating what uh, Pitching Ninja does with kind of those overlays and then um, adding those ball trails as well. Because um, I think that's a, it's a great topic point for potentially working on tunneling, especially if, you know, if, say, you have a staff that mm -hmm. primarily is focused on sink or slider, where, you know, there's, there's just a cut going either towards, you know, if it's a right-handed pitcher, it's going towards the left-handed batter's box. Or if it's the sinker, it's going to this right-handed batter's box. So that's a great thing for, for tunneling. So I'm essentially just working on being able to create a trail and then highlight that tunnel point between two different pitches. And then um, basically going back, let's say if there is kind of a track man or any type of data behind it that tells you kind of the release point, because I was able to figure out a way with track man flight scope data if I, if I have the release point, I can be able to uh, calculate the tunnel point. So then that way we could be able to calculate, okay, we can see it visually with video and then add in that overlay of data by saying, okay, here's the tunnel point. And here's, here's how much the differential is between, you know, your sinker and your slider. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely super interesting. I'd be curious to see to like just even the differences in release point, not necessarily just whether or not they're able to tunnel, but um maybe where release point is and then how that relates to where the ball ends up. 
and just more looking at it from a descriptive standpoint and observation, uh, just trying to understand like, well, how do things kind of work currently? Um, and one of the things that I've recently started to look into a little bit um, along this line of thinking is um, been listening to a lot of talks by David Snowden, and he's talking about the um, CIFIN framework. I'm not exactly uh, sure how it's necessarily pronounced because it's apparently a okay. Welsh. I believe it's a Welsh. Um, word and it's c y n e f i n um and the reason that they they kept it in welsh is because it doesn't translate well into english um but i'm i'm still trying to wrap my brain around all of it it's it's super interesting though um because he was talking about like how his coaches even when we're looking at video or watching a guy um, playing the game that we often only, we often only see what we anticipate to see or what we uh, expect to see. And because, because of that, we're often blind to other things. Um, this is basically something that we, that can be explained through, uh, concepts of perception, um, in that whatever we focus our attention on, we we tend to uh, have attentional blindness is the term. And so we don't see other things that uh, we're not attending to. So for example, um, everybody's heard, or a lot of people have heard of the um, passing basketball experiment. And I think we might've talked about this on a previous podcast as well, but um, it bears repeating. Um, and so per participants were asked to count the number of times uh, they passed a basketball around. and um, a man in a gorilla walks through, um, or a person in a gorilla suit walks through and they, then after they ask like, well, how many, how many times have you, uh, did you count the basketball getting passed back and forth? You know, did you get like 16 or whatever? And then they ask, well, how many people saw the gorilla? And a lot of people miss that. The same thing they did this with, um, uh, radiologist, I want to say, um, technicians, and they're looking at um, x-rays and they're looking at or x-rays or um, trying to remember what the other thing that they look at, like MRIs and stuff like that, other images, and they're looking for tumors or whatever. And they put in the, in some of these images, a very large um, gorilla. Not like super small, but like a a good sized gorilla, and a lot of the radiologists missed miss picking this up, and so it kind of speaks to this fact that oftentimes when we're looking at players, we tend to only see what we expect to see, um, and so that can be problematic in the sense that there's a lot of other information that we're just completely missing, um. And there's there's some other really great nuggets as well in terms of like this this too I think you know speaks to somebody who likes to run different experiments and you know the the power of uh, n to the one so to speak and the thing is is that when we try something and it ends up working um, a lot of times that can be attributed to simply to novelty. Like we tend to respond to novelty. So the example that David gives in one of his talks is that um, this company did um, they did an experiment where they uh, increased the amount of light in the room and it increased productivity. And they're like, wow, okay, so this must be the new thing that if we increase, if workplaces have brighter lights, then people will be more productive. And so they kind of ran with that. And then they conducted another experiment where they lowered the light and they found the exact same thing that people's productivity increased because they changed the lighting. And so really it, sometimes you have to actually run parallel experiments or have multiple um, experiments going simultaneously to kind of work out those effects. 
Um, and so I think that, that that's something that we have to keep in mind when we are working with athletes and um, running different experiments, because sometimes, you know, just be just, just simply it being a new novel experience can be beneficial um, for an athlete. And, and to me, this speaks to um, the fact that we should have a novelty within our training environment um, because it does help enhance the acquisition of skill. And I think that is very much um, a part of like the ecological approach is, is how we can utilize novelty for skill acquisition. Now we shouldn't be doing it all the time as much as possible, but having a healthy dose of that mixed within your normal um, training, um, I think is highly beneficial. Yeah, no, I mean, like, as you were talking, like a ton of thoughts came to my head. So like one that came to my head in terms of that novelty was, you know, a couple of years ago when I was working as a stock boy at a grocery store, we would have like these basically sheets and you would be assigned to an aisle. And basically you were basically saying like, Okay, if you have 60 items on your cart or whatever, you're expected to, you know, stock within 65 minutes, things along those lines. But mm -hmm. something that I found was whenever I would take a, a new way to work or just the, a different way to work prior than the previous day I worked, it turned out that I actually mm -hmm. did better than, you know, mm -hmm. just taking the same way to work over and over because it's like... Mm -hmm. We want to be able to say, okay, hey, you know, I always, I always like seeing people. It's like, what, what do you like about your job? And they say, there's always something new every day. So mm -hmm. that, that, you mm -hmm. know, there's, it's not like the same old, because once you get into kind of that repetitive environment, you're like, I've already done this before. Like, do I really need to keep doing it? Or, or two, you don't, you don't have to be cognitively present. Right. You know, it doesn't force you to adapt or to change. Right. Because you're just like, I've, I've done this before. Okay. Let's, I'll just get it over with. Go on autopilot. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. And so the thing with that in terms of like, you know, going back to athletes is yes, creating that, that type of, you know, novelty where, you know, oh, hey, we're going to take BP. But now it's like, hey, we're going to take BP, but except you're going to get thrown a ball from a right-handed pitcher, but then immediately after you finish your swing, a left-handed, you know, say you have um, two L screens, a left-handed pitcher is going to throw at you. And so you have to be able to read mm -hmm. both or, you know, just continuing to work on those environments of, uh, you know, those different environments. That way you can be like, well, you know, it's something new because you may not expect it. Um, and then another thing that did come up while you were talking is, about you know that uh attentional blindness it's where when does that for athletes when does that become a good thing and when does that become detrimental so remember when i tagged you ethan and um charlie i can't remember who else i who else i tagged in but there was the um tweet that went out on the study for soccer players and when they um anticipated or had higher in I think it was anticipation. I'll actually have to go look that up real quick. But essentially, when they um, anticipated, um, give me a quick sec. I want to actually get this more correct. I feel like it wasn't that long ago that I tagged you all in this. Also, I uh, tagged Josh. Rodriguez. Uh, okay. Let's go here. What was this? Knowledge of an opponent's preferences made a player more susceptible to, 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 sorry. Knowledge of an opponent's preferences made a player more susceptible to deception. And so to me, that, that comes back a little bit to anticipation. Um, and maybe, maybe sometimes, when we know too much information about an opposing pitcher or an opposing player, maybe for some guys who are aware of their strengths or their weaknesses or, you know, their scouting report, um, they can use that to their advantage to be more deceptive to the hitter. And, and so 
I wonder if that that goes to what you were talking about in terms of attentional blindness, like because you're you're focused, your attention is focused on what you're anticipating coming next doesn't allow you to actually connect with what's actually or connect to the information that's actually happening in front of you. Um, and it skews your perception of what's going on. So it makes you more susceptible to deception. Yeah. And the, uh, the thing that immediately came up was um, when um, Chris Carpenter, the former Cardinals pitcher, when he won comeback mm -hmm. player of the year in 2009, after basically missing two full seasons in 07, 08, that was the second year where they had pitch effects, so it wasn't quite, you know, to the level of Stackhouse, but it was still saying mm -hmm. that. But what he did was, since he knew that other teams were able to scout his recent start, he would do the opposite of essentially what the scouting report was. So that led to more deception, mm -hmm. and that that said, you know, he said that was a big thing to his success, where he was saying, okay, you know, my last start against Milwaukee, I was throwing a lot of fastballs first time around. Now, when I play Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. I'm going to throw curveballs first time around more frequently. And mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. led to more deception because maybe those teams were like, okay, based on this data, we can see that, okay, he's throwing fastball, fastball, fastball. But then he's like, no, I'm going to start you off with more curveballs first time around. And then the second time around, I'm be like, I don't know what to expect now. Right. And I think that that can be more easily utilized by a pitcher. Um, I think that's a little bit harder for a hitter to use, but it does, at least to me, speak to the fact that sometimes, um, actually now I remember what I was actually going to say. So where this kind of jumps off to me is that some of the things that I've been looking into as far as like from the hitter's perspective of this idea and this concept of perspective control um, or online control of, of action. Um, so basically being able to um, the information that you're receiving in the present helps you understand what is going to be happening in the, in the present future, essentially. So as things, as information um, comes out in real time, it lets you know where things are about to go but it doesn't necessarily always tell you where it's going to end up, but it's giving you more information about the things that are about to unfold. And so one thing though, that amateurs or intermediate athletes will do is they'll develop heuristics when, for example, the information is either coming too fast or the task is simple enough that you can use simple heuristics. And so for people who are less familiar with what the word heuristic means, the overly simplified definition um, is a shortcut. So essentially you're, you're developing a, a little shortcut, you know, you're picking up like one piece of information and then you're using it to basically um, tell you Ex what you think is going to happen. And so heuristics tend to be approximate. They don't tend to be highly accurate. So they get you in the ballpark. And so with that, I think a lot of how we have trained hitters is to develop heuristics so that they can be approximately right, just because we're like hitting's really hard. So let's try to figure out um, these basic heuristics. So um, I'm trying to think of of a good one here in terms of like how oftentimes we'll tell guys to just hunt fastballs um, or to hunt fastballs elevated. So we're trying to give them a heuristic, a very sh like a shortcut to, to narrow their focus a little bit to a certain area and, you know, or don't miss your fastball, which essentially I think makes it harder for could potentially work against hitters. If, if say the pitcher hangs a breaking ball, so a ball that they could potentially drive just as well, they lay off because they're they're sitting dead red on a fastball and they're only geared up to hit a fastball. Um, so in essence, because because they they have this heuristic of focusing on making sure they get their fastball, essentially they have a 
attentional blindness to the hanging breaking ball that they should be able to crush. Now, I know some coaches have um, their philosophy is broad enough to encapsulate that um, because, you know, if you switch it to this idea of only swing at pitches that you can do damage with, that would include the hanging breaking ball, right? So it, it changes the focus um, so that the deception, I guess, piece or like the attentional blindness for what we really care about uh, is, is minimized. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you kind of think of it in this way where you want to be able to maybe instead of focusing on, in your case, the elevated fastball, maybe just think about something completely different. Maybe say, all right, just see the batter's eye out there. Just focus on one spot for me. And that way, you know, you don't have to have this attentional blindness towards, you know, another pitch because now you're focusing on one pitch rather than now you're just focusing on, you know, the batter's eye. Hey, you know, ball comes, I'm going to make contact in, in kind of a, a different way of approaching it. Well, and I think from a training standpoint, right, is there can be a lot of benefit to that of like, okay, let's see how many balls can you find a way to drive to center field or to the, to the batter side, right? And from that, we can go back to kind of the novelty idea of, I was thinking about this, you know, all the time that we talk about, you know, for athletes, like find a way to get better today. I also think we should also challenge athletes. I want you to try something new today. Like every day you go to practice, I want you to do something you've never done before today. Like try to do it. Doesn't matter if you fail or you succeed. Just that, did you do something that new today? Did you try something new today? And I think that will, you know, the hope is to to essentially have what happened when you took a new way to work each day when it came to your productivity. There's there's something about that experience that helps you better understand things that you normally do. And so, you know, I, I don't think we necessarily have to always understand the inner workings of how something works, just that, you know, the principles behind of what it will do and how it can enhance your performance by trying new things. And so I think as important as it is to you know, trying to find a way to get better every day, I think it's equally as important to try something new every day, which I do think would also help with finding a way to get better every day. Yeah, no, I, I am with you there because then now you're, you're opening yourself up, you know, you're, you're opening your boundaries in, in a sense where instead of, you know, let's say you're more focused on a lot of long talks, but say, all right, hey, try something new, try throwing, you know, Try throwing with weighted balls today as, as a basic example. And so maybe, maybe he, you know, this pitcher throws with the weighted balls. Now he's like, hey, this is actually actually doing pretty well for me. Um, and then that way you can continue broadening your horizons and say, all right, now instead of, you know, now let's say I'll throw with weighted balls, but now I'll go to, you know, a, a, an adjusted form of long toss or something along those lines where, Maybe you're going back to kind of your roots, if you will, from what you know, but now you're kind of adding a adding newness to it or adding novelty, as you mentioned, where now we can say, all right, instead of just doing long toss, now we're going to do long toss this way. Or, you know, from a hitter's perspective, we can say, all right, now instead of, you know, just hitting for to hit, let's let's hit directionally. Let's say, okay, we're going to spray balls this way. We're going to spray balls this way. Or um, being able to create that by saying, okay, well, let's let's not focus on, you know, I don't want to say being a one-trick pony, but being able to be more adaptable in this case, where you can say, all right, well, let's let's do this thing and let's continue to build on it from going back to our roots and then continue to adding adding to our knowledge. And then, you know, you'll, you'll get this moment of, I guess, Zen, if you will, where it's like, wow, you know, most of the stuff that I learned in the past and the stuff that I'm now learning, now we're bringing it together. And now we're focusing on the new thing or the, you're combining elements. Right. And, and I do want to put a caveat in with, with the novelty thing and trying something new. I think when you're doing that, 
you also have to make sure that it's in the appropriate places because we also don't want to get injured, right? So like to me, if it's like a high intent thing, maximal load, say for example, like you talked about long toss. So in that process, maybe trying something new more you know, when you're closer in, you know, like understand what your capabilities are and how much outside the norm are you asking of yourself and try to not be too far out, especially like, say, for example, like, let's say you're squatting near your maximum, right? You don't want to try to experiment with your form when you have, you know, your 90% on the bar or more, right? So kind of the same thing here when, when it comes to throwing or whatever, like when you're doing high intent work, if you're out at your max distance, that's not the good, that's not the best time to try to throw it sidearm or from underneath, you know, and see how far you can flip it all the way out there like that. That's probably not, um, especially if you've never done it before, you know, and, and I think back to, um, when I was coaching NAIA and I was talking with, uh, their center fielder and he was like, yeah, I had an arm injury, uh, last year or the year before or whatever. And, you know, I heard it because I picked a ball and I, f and I tried to flip it in uh sidearm, um, or from under down underneath, uh, throwing it back to, into the infield. And I was like, okay, he tried something new there and, uh, his body was not prepared for it. And he's, he's, he strained his forearm or his UCL. So, you know, that's where we have to be smart with how we do this and when and where we do this. And it's going to be different for every guy. Like, you know, like the shortstop on that same team could throw from down under like, you know, 200 plus feet, you know, and it was going to hurt his arm, but he did a lot of stuff like that. He threw from a lot of, a lot of different arm slots and he had been doing that for a long time. And so it, it really just comes back to like how well prepared is your body to do these different things. So when you're trying something new, also have an appreciation for um, how risky is what you're going to do to injure you. And we still got to take some risk, but you want to take calculated risk. I think that's, that's the most important thing. And that was the same thing that uh, David Stoden was, was talking about is that when we're running you know, parallel experiments and stuff, you want to be running safe relatively like, like, or when we're dealing with complex systems and we're going to run it, run experiments, we, we want, we need to appreciate the fact that it's more than likely going to fail because of, because of it, the complexity of things like complex systems tend to, you know, things don't work out. So you want to take um, very calculated, non-threatening risks. And so when we're talking about novelty, you should take, um, you shouldn't take out uh, lopsided or highly risky um, experiments or novel movements. So trying something new, try something new within your bounds that you know that you can safely do, I think is a good way. Like just like driving a new way to work. Well, you also want to leave yourself enough time to get there on time, right? right. So it's not, you, you need to, you need to have a, an appreciation for like the context and, and that you're going to be able to achieve the things that you need to achieve without risking losing your job as, you know, going to work for an example. Right. Yeah. Cause then, then you create, um, so you're basically just working within trying something new, but within constraints or bounds, like you mentioned, where. Mm -hmm. You are, you can, so yeah, going back to the long toss thing, you know, don't, don't obviously try to flip it overhand when you're at, you know, 350 feet between two players. Like that's not, that's not going to bode well. Or, or pick up an 11 ounce and you haven't, you haven't consistently been throwing it with an 11 ounce and just try to throw it right. 300 plus or, feet. Like that's not. That's not a good right. idea. Or, you know, on the converse side, pr pick up a liar ball and, you know, just try to whip it as hard as you can. That that may conversely also, you know, not be very potentially well for you when, you know, most, let's say through most of the long toss, you're just throwing with a regular baseball. You don't want to bring this small ball and just whip it immediately because then, you know, there, your body might be telling you, no, like, don't do that. Please stay away from that. Mm hmm. 
And, and that's some of the things though, when I'm thinking about like doing novelty and new things, what will happen and what tends to happen when you, when you start sampling uh, new ideas, you, you do new experiments, you fail. What comes from that is you begin to learn and new opportunities for movement begin to emerge out of that. Like all of a sudden you'll be like, you know what? I think I can do this today. Like say for example, um, like you were saying, like picking up a, a two or three ounce ball. Like I think I can throw this, you know, from this arm angle or, or throw it this distance or um, I'm trying to think of like, even just with a regular ball, like today I can actually figure out how to throw this on the run. Let's say I'm an infielder and I'm struggling with something like that. Like new new movement capabilities will begin to emerge through this exploration and through this, um, through this novel movement or this novel experimentation. Yeah. And so you kind of think of it, you know, from a batter standpoint, because now I kind of think of it in this sense where, you know, in terms of using these different types of balls or in the batter sense, you know, maybe an overload slash underload bat, you know, allowing yourself to be like, okay, if, if you think you can do this today, go for it. But, you know, being able to also recognize that, you know, after a few swings, be like, no, this is like my body's telling me something like don't don't feel like you have to push yourself through that limit like right away, because then mm -hmm. then you're just in now that it comes to the point where now this calculated risk becomes just risk. You're taking out the calculation part of it because. You're just more focused on, oh, no, you know, since I started, I have to finish this. Right. It's the difference of like using a regular weighted bat versus grabbing Bryce Harper's like 37, 48 or whatever, right. and trying to swing that thing. Right. I don't I don't remember exactly what uh, his weighted bats that he was swinging at, like um, age 17 or whatever. But like, I mean, those things were were just mammoth bats and those were not your traditional like they're not driveline. Uh, overload bats you know like it's not it's not like that right because i know i had been talking to you about um or you and ethan were bringing up the fact that the new um there's a new video database right for uh mlb and a lot of the plays and stuff that you're able to get on StatCast and all that sort of data, you guys have um, been able to find the video that accompanies that data, more or less. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's a big thing because now, um, you know, especially as we were talking about earlier, being able to cut video, the other thing to be able to do that with and the video letter that, that I got now is able to do that where you can overlay that data on top mm. of it, where you can say, all right, here's, you know, the, the spray angle, here's the exit velocity launch angle, so on and so forth with that video, because with all of the players that you're coaching, the athletes, some of them might be able to understand, okay, here's numbers. Here's how you get better. Others might be able to understand, oh, here's video. Here's how you get better. But then others building onto that, might need a combination of both. And so that's where mm -hmm. it comes mm -hmm. in, where getting that data and um, overlay system kind of going be, allows us to create that. Yeah, actually on that note, like kind of what I was getting at before with the, with looking at the, the overlays is that I wonder too, if you could even look at like success versus um, non-success. So for example, like you do the overlays for pitching, like, okay, which are the locations that, um, or release points that lead to, uh, strikes or lead to swing and misses, you know, Hey, here are all the release points of balls that, um, have good break and break out of the zone. Like they'll start in the zone. They end up out of the zone or, here are all the release points for your fastball that end up in the strike zone or something like that. And maybe, maybe it's not just that. Maybe like you also do the overlay and you're like, actually, here's where the difference, the big difference is, is like how your lead lead arm or lead shoulder or trunk is rotating. And like, Hey, it's, it, 
it alters this and maybe it alters the release point. Maybe the release point is the same, um, but it'd be cool to see in the overlay um, what that variation is and like, where's the good variation and potentially what the bad variation looks like. Right. So then you essentially create those bounds, you know, through some uh, statistical method. So you could use like Z, Z scores, um, standard deviation, mm. stuff like that where essentially you're just saying, okay, within this, you know, we'll call it buckets, within these buckets of release points, here's where your good variation is at. And then within these buckets of release points, here's where your bad variation is at. And speaking on top of that, there was a um, picture list article that came out. I think it was like yesterday, um, Ethan did retweet it and that's how I found it out. But mm. basically it was this uh, guy that helped kind of some of these major league pitchers where while they had this video of them pitching, he would basically overlay kind of where, where in the zone with what pitch they were throwing was the most successful. And they would, he would use kind of like a color scheme where it's like red is bad, you know, blue is good. And being able to create that on top of a video is also crucial. And then like you brought up being able to understand release points. So basically creating like, I guess, like a little square of buckets, if you will, and say, all right, here's where your good variation release points at. So if you reach your, if you release here, you're going to expect good variation. But if you release here, you're going to expect bad variation. Um, mm -hmm. So then that way you can continue to develop and say, okay, hey, I'm focusing on here. So that way, when you are, you know, throwing, help the pitchers or help the batters understand, hey, you know, try to help them understand, hey, when I move my arm this way or when I do this specific movement, I'm going to expect good variation. And, you know, have them like commit that, not necessarily like commit that to, you know, short-term memory, but kind of commit that to more long-term memory. So that way, you know, when we come into what we talked about earlier about attentional blindness, they don't have to be like focusing on, okay, I got my, got to get my release point this way when, you know, that's only one part of the equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to like, if I'm thinking about it from an ecological perspective, it's like, okay, what information are they connecting with or, um, where is their focus of attention? Like, is it more internal or is it more external? Um, what other outside factors too could be affecting their focus of attention? Um, you know, what other sort of kind of rate limiters, um, you know, for example, like pressure, you know, whether that's coming from the opposing team, the score, an umpire, a coach, or somebody in the stands, et cetera. Um, what things could also be, uh, affecting their system and the outcomes that we're seeing? Cause maybe, maybe, you know, when, a, if, if we were to create some sort of a pressure situation, would their um, would their movement patterns like become more rigid or more um, variable, and maybe it would look a certain have a certain characteristic? So it'd be very interesting to see. Like, and that's that's where to me, like um, gathering data and actually looking at it would would really help us out. You know, because I, I do think sometimes we try to take theories that we that we have developed and we're like, I think this makes logical sense. And then you try to force everybody into that theory without just first observing the data and just understanding, OK, what is like what what does success look like? You know, because oftentimes we haven't even looked at it yet and we're like, oh, this this is breaking all the rules of our theory and we need to change them. It's like, but there are, but they're having success. Like, where are we going to change this? And then, then you, then you're like, then you find somebody who it's not working on, and then you're like, oh, okay. So then let's get them into this parameter. And it's like, well, maybe, maybe again, just like that, um, that example I gave before of like with the lights, you know, increasing the light and decreasing the light. Like, well, what if, what if the um, he gave another example of like people who look at successful companies and they go and ask the successful people, like, why are they successful? And you, and they give a recount of the things that they did. And then he asked the author of this one book who had, had done something like that. Well, did you go and look at and talk to the people who had uh, failed companies? And he said, no, why would I do that? 
And he has said, because oftentimes when you actually go look at the people who failed, they oftentimes did the same thing that the people su- who did that succeeded. So it becomes, becomes this question of like, well, if you're just kind of looking at like, say, for example, with the pitchers who don't fit your model, but yet are successful, you're like, oh, they're outliers. And then you go look at the people who are not successful doing the exact same thing, who don't fit your model and you quote unquote change. Um, that might not be the real differentiator there as to like what is really causing um, them not to be successful. Right. Cause then, then as you brought it up, um, you know, with the pictures that don't fit the model, then you might also say, Oh, they're outliers too. But then mm-hmm. if you have outliers on both sides, that's a really bad model either way, because right then right. you're just, you're just creating your own, uh, the own uh, deviation between the people that are in the model. Whereas, you know, mm-hmm. picture, picture A and picture B are on opposite ends of outliers, but then picture C, D, E, and F are within it. But within that grouping, they are so varied in their, you know, pitch classification or whatever you want to classify by. Where it becomes to the point where what, what are you really trying to classify? And now you're just mm-hmm. asking the question, okay, are are we really trying to classify anything or are we just, did we just build a model and not, not try to do anything about it? Mm-hmm. And to, well, I'm thinking about like these overlays that you were talking about. I'm like, Ooh, it'd be cool to see the overlays of, you know, all the different hits or maybe like, I want to see an overlay of, of, you know, let's use Trout as an example, since there are several of those out there of like him hitting a, a pitch up in the zone, a fastball up and a fastball down, you know, in certain locations are like, hey, let's do an overlay of all the fastballs or let's do an overlay of all the breaking balls. Um, let's do an overlay of, you know, like to the question that I'd asked um, to the group about, you know, with fastballs, like when guys swing and miss, where do they tend to swing and miss? on four seam fastballs do they tend to miss over miss under like what it'd be cool to get an overlay of like all fastballs that guys have missed and just to see like hey where are they missing you know obviously there'll be some variation there but i wonder if there there may be some common themes that emerge from that um that could lead to useful strategies to trying to um, improve that outcome of increasing contact rate with say for example a fastball Um, yeah, so that, that that would be something that I think you could use the overlays to ask a lot of different questions to just beyond, um, looking at adjustability, um, and or tunneling or whatever, you could begin to ask a lot more questions. Right. Cause then you, you, it becomes a question of, you know, with that data that was presented, um, you see that there's a lot of whiffs, but how are they whiffing? Are they are they you know swinging mm-hmm. over it? Are they swinging under it? You you just you see that most of the time you know it's whiffs, but you don't really know what kind of whiffs they are. Are they? You can guess by essentially saying, "All right, well, the next highest frequent point is they're getting under it a lot." But does that necessarily mm-hmm. mean this when they whiff, they're also getting under it, or are they just getting over it? And then you can kind right. of factor in other things like location. They might be getting under it, um, you know, when it's up in the zone, but they might be getting over it when it's down in the zone. Who knows? But Mm -hmm. again, Mm -hmm. it's just for this purpose of asking more questions. Right. And and two, I think when we're thinking about the data, um, you know, and what baseball um, savant can provide for us, like that's one part of the equation. So like all the 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 hard numbers uh minus the video tell one story but when you can bring the two together it begins to paint a clearer picture and so that's you know when we're talking about whiff rates that only tells part of the story when you actually pull up the video and you actually look at you know how are they moving when that happens um and i think who was it was it Caleb that had um put out a video of of two swings on there were slightly different pitches, but one was a home run with Bellinger and another was a swing and a miss. Right. Yeah. And it was like, he basically moved the same. So if we're going to talk about how 
you know, his he had a movement flaw when he missed the ball. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know if that's necessarily true. If it was simply that, like, there was it was a mechanical flaw that caused him to miss that ball. Right. Because he used those, he basically, it looks like to the naked eye that he used the, basically the same mechanics to hit the right. ball out. So is it really that, or is it more complicated than right. that? Or could it be something like internal focus, where maybe one pitch he was like, all right, I'm going to try to hit the top of the baseball. But then the next pitch, I'm going to try to hit the bottom of the baseball. And, it, you know. Or we could go back to what we were talking about before. He was anticipating a certain pitch. and through that anticipation, he wasn't as locked into picking up information from the ball. Therefore, he s- was slightly off in terms of um, his swing. Right. And, and another thing with like commonalities with um, kind of, I know at, at my high school, at least when I played, like when you knew this guy had a big fastball, you're like, I'm ready, I'm going to swing. But then maybe, maybe, you know, Bellinger knew that, hey, this guy had a good big fastball. Hey, I'm going to swing quicker, you know, on the first swing rather than the second swing where he's like, I'm geared up for it. I'm ready. But then when it does come, you know, he thinks the perceived velocity is actually higher than it is. Yeah. And two, we don't, I, I'd have to actually go back and look to try to see what the count was, you know, like, cause count, um, makes a difference different pitchers also would make a difference in terms of, of that, you know, and, and so, um, yeah, but I'm curious, do you know how, um, how to look up that video? Like where do, if somebody wanted to be able to pull, you know, video, the way that we were talking about it being clipped per pitch, do you know, um, how would one find that on Baseball Savant? So I would say better yet, instead of going on Baseball Savant, I'll share my screen. Mm-hmm. All right. So instead of actually going through Baseball Savant, now that MLB has their own video search database, it's just MLB.com slash video slash search. You can now okay. create kind of this these sequences. So um, of that at bat, while I pull it up real quick, um, before I forget that. But uh, of that at bat, you can be able to say, okay, you essentially just create filters and it's essential since the video database is so big, you know, you don't want to, um, you want to just boil it down to whatever you need to boil it down to. So going back, we see that there, there are two different pitches and they're essentially in the same zone, but you essentially pick, okay. So the one on the left where he had a home run was against, um, Michael Waka. So what you do is you go back into this and you'll essentially just select batter, type in Cody Bellinger, and then pitcher Michael Waka. And if you knew it was a home run, you'd go over the play filter and you'd say hit result, go down to home run. And you can see right here, you pull it up. I'll mute the volume, but you have it pulled up, video plays, boom, home run. So essentially, if you know batter, if you know pitcher, and if you know result, you can pull it up rather quickly. Now for like um, certain like balls and strikes. So like if you want to look at, you know, Cody Bellinger, like taking a strike, you can go to game and it give, allows you to select like certain counts. Um, mm. so that's, that's another thing you can add. So the other one I think was with Chris Paddock. So we'll replace that and we'll say Chris Paddock. I believe it was him. And then instead of saying home run, we'll say, well, I guess, uh, 
we can't instead of saying hit result, we'll say pitch result. And there are small strike. That lets me click on it. But yeah, sometimes it does take some time because again, it's it's filling through a very large large database. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, man, it's slowing down your internet. <laughs> Because I bet you there were a lot of swing, swing and misses. But so we have these four. So now we can, I don't know the exact date, but you essentially at least now have four. So I remember Paddock was wearing a um, away jersey, like a gray jersey. So it's either one of these two. So it might have been a strikeout. It might have been a swinging strike. But, you know, you just guess and check. So, again, I will. Put this on mute and see. So it's it's a little bit outside, so it wasn't necessarily that one. So you can exit out of that and go to this one. And essentially, there it's about the same pitch again. It was an 0-2 count, so you understand that when it was Waka, there was one strike. With Paddock, there was two strikes. So when you brought up count, that might have played a factor too. Well, or the fact that it was just a different pitcher. Exactly. You know. And two, though, I think I think there are go back to home runs by Paddock or uh, with because uh, it I think there there was a few where um, he was uh, he had actually hit a home run off of him, too. So it'd be it'd be interesting to see just from the standpoint of like. um. You know, was it a fastball that he hit out? Like, what pitch did he hit out? Obviously, we could pull this off of uh, Savant. That, that one wants to change it. But you can actually, I believe so. Yeah. So That was a change up away. So pitch type, you can actually select the pitch type as well and be able to say, okay, well, we only want to see fastballs. We only want to see, you know, how many fastballs. Um so, and another thing you can actually do because, you know, the, the video search is limited because right now it doesn't tell you, mm -hmm. you can't filter by like pitch location. So if you all, like when you mentioned with trout, you only want to see his pitches up and in or his pitches down and in, that's where you can go on to say baseball savant. Of course, it's the first thing that comes up because I use it frequently. Then you can say, all right. Um, Go to batter, and we'll say batters. Just type in trout, and then we go to our game day zone. So I think this is from the catcher's perspective. So you set up and down and in. So now you go one and seven. Now you select, let's say, fastballs in this case, and we'll select all stat cast. And let's just do... We can sort by just about anything. So I'll just say average exit velocity. So um, just hit search, and you can see 472 pitches. You just click on it, and you have all of these. But now, now that you have kind of this information, not only, you can save it as a CSV, so don't, uh, don't forget about that. Because then what essentially you can do from a coding perspective is you can manipulate this URL up here by saying, okay, replace this with, you know, Mike Trout, replace this with, you know, the picture that he's up against, and then it'll automatically filter those videos. So I know that the video search has every video from 2017 to the present. So 2016 and 2015 may be a little bit harder to find um, with plays. If you scroll back down, it looks like a lot of the videos are now linked. Right. So, I mean, you could also, you could also, you know, video if you're doing like something specific. Mm -hmm. Yes. But then once, once you kind of go down here, now it's like, okay, what if I'm interested in this Mike Trout ground out mm -hmm. um, on a pitch in to the second baseman? So now you would essentially just go, okay, I know that the game date was September 3rd. I know the count was 1 1. So essentially, what you'll do is I'll just clear all these. And now, instead of saying Cody Bellinger, let's do Mike Trout. And we know that the count was 1-1, so 
one ball, one strike. And then it was the 2017 season. And the pitcher was Martin Perez, from what we saw. So we just type in Martin Perez. And we can still get that video either way. Mm -hmm. So now we have this video. So a little fastball up and in, and he, was, he grounded out to the right side. But as you brought up, you can see how, you know, once you kind of uh, get these videos, so essentially what you can do is the share button, you just copy this URL and you just save it into, you know, save that URL. And then that way you can be able to kind of get these videos and then create your overlays in that mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, so like for most of the time, yeah, you know, especially with recent, so like 2019, you're going to have a ton of video that's already available if you're like on a specific thing. But like something that I was curious about was this. So I was interested on two seam fastballs and sinkers from right-handed pitchers and left-handed batters that were hit for home runs. And the thing was, the pitch not only had to be away, but actually down and away out of the zone. So 13, so this is from the catcher's perspective again, 13 being out of the zone. So I select that, and let's see, and I say the PA result, I want it to be home runs. And then I'll say sort by average exit velocity. But I select all the stat cast era, left-handed batter, right-handed pitcher. I was curious because two seam and fastball, two seam fastballs and sinkers are running away from the left-handed batter. How can these batters pull it for a home run? So then you could also go to, let's see, if I remember where, batted ball direction, and you just select pull. <laughs> and you hit uh -huh. search. And there may not be very many because again, it's it's a pitch that's not shouldn't be designed that is a two seam or a sinker that's going down and out of the zone to be pulled by a left handed hitter or a home run. And so you see that there's only been four of those instances, and Ryan Flary hit two of them. So unfortunately, these were in 2015, and when I did look them up earlier, the video wasn't there. And Ryan Schimpf, there was no, there's nothing uh, appearing there for a play result. And then Carlos Santana. So we have 2017, and so we know that the count's 3-1, and we know that he's against James Shields. So we say James Shields in this case. And instead of Mike Trout, we'll say Carlos Santana. And now instead, we'll say three and one. And it should be this one right here. So now we look at this pitch. Two C, and that's going out of the zone, yet Santana still pulls it out for a home run in a windy city like Chicago. So that's that's Which, the beauty of video search. And two, it helps like 13, that zone, it encapsulates such a big part of outside the zone. Basically like belt high and down is 13. You know, like right. if you go back up to when it pops up the zone. So if you right. look at 13, it covers a large area. Well, Right. That pitch was borderline 11, you know, like it was, right. it wasn't like down and away, like by seven, you right. know what I mean? Like it was up by four. And so I think, I think that's where, oh, okay. That makes more sense that it wasn't just down and away. Like that's the, un, that's unfortunately like the hard part about those pitches. Like I get why they made right. the zone the way they did. Because they're probably like, we don't care what happens in that zone very often, or at least the assumption right. is, is that we don't, but I mean, that's where it becomes, see, that's more interesting. Like zone 17, right? right. Like zone 17 or zone 27. If someone were to, a left-handed hitter were to pull a home run that way. I know from my experience using this, it's mm -hmm. a little bit harder to search for because 
I think they don't they don't use these or they don't have it ready for 2015 and 2016 yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so they have it from 2017 in the present. Um, so I kind of just go to game day zones, but again, let's, we can just try it out right now and see. So instead of selecting 13, let's say, like you mentioned, 17 or 27. And if nothing comes up, we could also search for right-handed hitters against left-handed pitchers. Mm -hmm. Um, the other side. So we search that up. And again, like if video doesn't come up for it, video doesn't come up for it. But you can still see, oh, hey, that's kind of cool that someone hit a opposite field home run. Or I should say a pulled home run on a pitch that was down and away in this sense. Well, and they have exit velos on that too. And you look at Carlos Santana's EV on that. It was 98. It was and whereas right. the other two were like a hundred plus. So kind of goes to what you're saying of it being the windy city there. Right. Yeah. So then you, so you can see like with the attack zones, well, there's no, no results. So now mm -hmm. let's instead say 19 and 29 and then switch the pitcher and batter handedness. Well, so, and two, maybe, maybe it'll occur. There's more likelihood of it occurring with it being a righty just because there may be more, more frequent. Yeah. yeah. So but the matchup might be harder because there aren't as many uh, lefty pitchers right. as righty pitchers. So I guess that might uh, play a role. There. So I guess I'll ask you this. What's more impressive than a pulled home run from, you know, a left or right handed batter against the opposite hand who throws a two seamer sinker? Or the same hand who throws a two seamer sinker. Because when you, let's say you have a righty righty, you already know that that pitch is starting away. It might come back to the zone, but again, that's maybe that's why maybe they track it better to be able to come back to the zone or a pitch that starts in the zone and starts to go away. So there's no results here. So I wonder case. now, now if you were to change it from batted ball pull, now what if you were to go just just to eliminate that and just go all fields. And let's just see, because I think just in general that if that ball goes out, like that's incredibly difficult. So not just pull, like, can but you even if, hit that ball out? Right. And so like, it would take a lot, but exactly. So it would take a lot of strength to be able to pull that ball going down and away. And again, like, this should happen for everybody who uses the stat cast search. Like it's going to take time to load because it's going through all the squares. So Reynado Yunez and Alex Rodriguez are the only two players to have a pull. And so this one is in 2017. So we can actually look that up um, from Martin Perez. So let me look at the count. So the count was actually one, two as well. That's pretty cool. So that's the other thing that's impressive. So one, two, and we'll say Renato Nunez against, I wonder if I can type in his last name, but I'll just type in his first name, Martin Perez. So this one. So that pitch looked like it was in the zone. Um, but it was still hit for a home run. So maybe it was like this just edge of 19. So it's like somewhere between nine and 19. Well, isn't the strike zone that dotted line? Yes. Yes. So, so yeah, really, been in really that, that's... That, that top right corner of that 19. Mm -hmm. So then obviously with a rod, you probably can't pull that up. Um, since yeah, we can try it though. So, Let's try it, see if anything comes up. But more than likely not because, again, like there's data from 20, uh, 2017 to the present in terms of video. But once you go past that, it it's kind of like a, I don't want to say a wasteland, but a little bit harder to find. So I'll just type in A-Rod, and so uh, it automatically comes up, no video available. 
because again, that, having video for every single pitch, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of, uh, memory and storage. So, but yeah, so there's, there's a ton of stuff you can do with stat, StatCast video search. And like I said, I would say start with MLB's video search. If you know, like a specific player and what you want to look at. So like in Caleb's case, like Cody Bellinger fastballs, you can be able to see that. But if you don't, maybe if you're missing variables, you can go to StatCast and say, well, if there's already video there, great. But if not, you can go back to the video search and be able to get that. Mm -hmm. And this is my TED talk. Dude, I think this is great just because I think, you know, it makes me wonder, like, where do where do a lot of people get their videos from? And I think this is probably the easiest way to go get those videos and to go look at them and to um, do that observation yourself um, and that kind of study and analysis. So, yeah, I mean, I highly encourage people to to make use of it. I think, you know, as much as we rag on MLB, you know, and I, I think there's, you know, rightly so to a certain extent. Um, for for you know hitting hitting people with a lot of copyright um and not letting people like row the game so to speak i think the reason that they put out all this free data though in this video is to try to actually grow the game like i think they're understanding like coaches and and other people like i mean this should be used for marketing like people can take it and make gifts and all sorts of other things. I think it would help grow their game tremendously, but you know, this is one thing that I think MLB has done different than a lot of other sports and it's been to their benefit. Like I think they've reaped, reaped some of the benefits, you know, of them doing that and having all this data out there, it's allowed them to get into analytics a lot sooner than other sports. Um, right. you, you were on, you were on the football, a football, um, analytics round table. Um, yeah. You know, what, where is football on the analytics side of things? Do you know? So football's starting to grow. Um, someone, I think his name's Seth Walder. He recently published like uh, known people who are working for NFL teams. Mm -hmm. And some of these departments are starting to grow. Um, I think the Eagles at the time had the deepest uh, kind of like analytics staff, but every year, what the NFL does is they do um, kind of the big data bowl. And what essentially that does is they give you kind of advanced data. Mo most of the time it's like uh, player tracking mm -hmm. where all the players are essentially dots and they move as, you know, mm -hmm, as, mm -hmm. as the play happens. So, uh, so with some of the stuff, like some of these people are like creating really, really cool stuff where you're essentially, I know one guy, can't remember his name, but he did a really good presentation on like predicting uh, offensive line movements, understanding, okay, if you know, like who's going to blitz, can you better predict, you know, the offensive line moving that or better yet, if you know that maybe you didn't account everybody for a blitz, can your offensive, can your model be able to predict that offensive line you know, accounting for that and making that adjustment on the fly, you know, within less than seconds, but milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. on the, on the football end, it's, it's picking up. Um, and then they just had one on basketball as well. And that's another thing that's been picking up as well. So um, I know, but on the thing that like we just talked about, like, that video side of the MLB has a huge advantage because you don't have, yes, you may be able to share, you know, those, those clips maybe on the NFL side, but it's not as presently available as right now the MLB video search is mm -hmm. compared to other mm -hmm. sports. So they have that advantage. Good stuff. What do you want to wrap up on? We've been going for a good little bit here. <laughs> I did not realize it's eight 30 already. Yeah. <laughs> good Lord. Uh, I mean, if you want to end on modus, we can. Well, I feel like that's its own long conversation. So, all right, um, sounds good. Yeah, I I guess I would highly encourage people to look up David Snowden and the CFIN framework. Um, 
that's been recently shared in my circles and I've, I've really liked it a ton. I mean, it's, it's the guy who talks about her, David, he, he's, he's worked in it is my understanding. Um, and a lot of self software development. And so he, he spends a lot of time talking to that audience in terms of how to create better software, um, and working in teams, but, the application of what he's talking about applies very much to sports and not just like the coach on the ground with the athlete, but to organizations as well. Like this, this is an organizational type framework um, that talks about how to work in teams. Um, and so there's just a ton of application for, for anybody who wants to dive into something and, and figure out how to translate that to baseball. Um, so that's going to preoccupy some of my time moving forward is trying to just understand this framework a little bit better and then try to figure out also how to articulate it because I don't think today I did it justice. This is just me like first dabbling in it a little bit. Um, but hopefully over time as just the same as how I've gotten into ecological dynamics and, and um, being better able to explain that and the constraint led approach and all that sort of stuff um, that's improved over time. I think it'll take me a little bit to be able to articulate this kind of framework uh, well. So anyways, um, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast and then, um, be sure. I have also, I've appreciated the different people who have uh, been listening to our older podcasts and uh, been hitting us up on social media. So that's been really cool. Absolutely. Highly appreciate that. So again, if you want to reach out to us, um, it's G B O Y U M zero one um, on Twitter or Robert, your handle is? At Robert Troy 40 so capital R-O-B-E-R-T, capital F-R-E-Y, not F-R-Y-E, F-R-E-Y, 40, R-O-B-E-R-T, F-R-E-Y, 40. Um, no no underscore, no, no spaces. No underscore, no spaces. All, all together. All together. So, yeah, if you have any questions about the StatCast video search or the MLB.com video search, like, do not hesitate to reach out to me. I am on that thing probably a couple hours every day just because a lot of things again like a, a project that I'm working on is being able to overlay you know stat cast data with the actual video is something that obviously I, I'm not going to share but share publicly but you know kind of my, my own internal research so I am on a lot so I, I feel like I'm pretty well versed in it so if you have any questions on like how to search and how to best optimize your searching skills like do not hesitate to reach out. You heard it first here on Finding the Edge podcast. Till next time. Analyzing.